Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Mark Novakowski from CMU, uh, applying lessons from edge systems to space platforms. How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Mark Novakowski. I work with the uh, Software Engineering Institute at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, we, uh, my group has been uh, spending about a decade working on uh, edge systems. Um, I'm here today to kind of talk about uh, how some of the lessons that we've learned from that work uh, may have some overlap and may be useful uh, in this domain. Um, now, you know, I've been sitting here for three days listening to a lot of incredible work or a lot of really great deep dives. Um, and I just want to do a little bit different. I want to take a step back, um, look at it maybe a little bit of a higher perspective um, and uh, look at, um, you know, some ideas that uh, kind of might help uh, this community uh, move forward as you continue to work on these problems. <clears throat> so this is where I say I'm not responsible for anything that I'm about to say. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna start today with kind of an overview of uh, what is edge programming. Um, and obviously everybody here will be very familiar with that stuff, but we're gonna do that just to kind of level set. Uh, we're going to talk about um, where the overlaps are uh, between edge programming and space platforms um, and really kind of get into, um, you know, where those, uh, where we can look at for some, uh, for some lessons. Um, and uh, then I'm going to present uh, what we've created, which is a reference architecture uh, for really kind of uh, modeling uh, edge so software systems. Um, and I'm going to close out with some thoughts about how to apply that um, and some focus areas uh, that we could maybe look at uh, going forward. So, all right, so again, um, this should not be a uh, surprise to anybody here, uh, but edge software systems, you know, they operate at the edge of the connected network, you know, and you want to be there um, because it's close to where computation and data are processed and needed. Um, you're often going to have some reach back to some cloud systems, um, and you're really going to often work as intermediaries uh, between users. Um, and you want to do this for a variety of reasons. Obviously, you want to reduce your latency. Uh, you want to optimize your bandwidth potentially by doing some pre-processing. Um, and you're going to get a lot of value out of this, uh, both uh, increasing higher resiliency and availability. And if you build your systems right, uh, you could potentially also improve your privacy and security. Uh, but obviously, this is harder than uh, your standard commercial software development. Uh, what we're talking about here, obviously, is dealing with power challenges, computational resource challenges, uh, dealing with uh, unreliable networks, um, and uh, doing, trying to do all that in uh, harsh environments, right? Um, no surprises there. So uh, thinking about that, uh, this really gets to our motivation, because uh, when we kind of think about uh, what are the aspects and the challenges that, that uh, uh, edge systems and, and uh, space platforms have? There's a lot of overlap here, right? So uh, while the causes of why our communications um, and uh, environmental problems may be different, uh, you know, they really kind of uh, end up with the same sort of solution. You're really going to end up with some uh, limited power, limited computational capability, uh, environmentally rugged uh, pieces of hardware to do the work that you're doing. <clears throat> so what I think um, what we're seeing here is there's a, a good amount of convergence, you know, and, you know, just listening to the talks uh, that we've heard for the last couple of days um, and also looking at the uh, the history of talks uh, for the flight software workshop going back a couple of years, um, there's really kind of a lot of commonality in the sorts of technologies that we use. And as an example, you know, I wrote this list not thinking that it was going to be for a space conference. I wrote this list because it is what I generally encounter when I'm working on edge software systems, uh, whether, you know, it's at the tackle edge on military applications or dealing with humanitarian disasters, uh, you know, earthquakes and, and hurricanes and all that. Um, and yet, 
pretty much everything on this list we've heard. And if we didn't hear it the last couple of days, it's definitely um, in uh, some of the you know presentations from the last couple of years. And I even put a little star next to Ada because the last thing that I expected to hear is in a previous life, um, I worked really closely, uh, you know, as a defense contractor building some Ada systems. And I'm like, that's not going to come up. Uh, but no, no, you know, day one, it was part of the conversation. So there's clearly, you know, some convergence uh, that's going on here. And that really kind of gives us an opportunity to think about uh, some of the lessons learned and also some of the, uh, the solutions that have been made available uh, in edge systems. So um, how are we going to get at this? Well, one of the things that SCA really um, likes to do is to look at reference architectures kind of as a framing device to really kind of break down what are the needs and the requirements uh, for um, a particular uh, software stack. So what we did is we developed a reference architecture for edge software systems, and this really focuses on uh, the amount of uncertainty, which really kind of uh, defines a lot of the challenges that you have uh, in edge software. Um, and when you're supporting the, the cloud to edge continuum, uh, and what you really need to do is need, need to make sure that your systems are aware of a variety of factors, obviously the network, uh, where you are, uh, the resources you have available, and the environment that you're in. Often you need to make sure they're secure by construction, um, and often you're going to end up wanting to have them highly modular. Now, of course, uh, this is very familiar to everyone in this room, uh, but potentially we can uh, leverage some of the solutions here. So what we have here, and I understand it's a little bit of an eye chart, um, <clears throat> is our reference architecture. Um, and I'll kind of go over piece by piece, um, but the point is that this is kind of a standard layered architecture uh, for edge software systems. And the real contribution that we've made is the, uh, the left-right separation of those middle three layers there, um, where we're talking, uh, we're kind of comparing, contrasting uh, the technologies uh, that you may use uh, for kind of your standard commercial software development versus the technologies that have been developed specifically for edge software systems. Uh, so up here at the top, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, obviously, uh, in uh, previous life, uh, I did a lot of research on uh, uh, doing uh, cognitive load management uh, for user interfaces, but uh, really, unless we get into a world where there's a whole lot more manned space flight, um, uh, I don't think that's going to apply too much here. So this kind of gets to the, the meat of what we're trying to uh, express here. Um, so uh, over here on the left, we have three main layers. First, you have your application-specific services. That's really kind of the business logic um, that your system might do, where you're doing most of your AI ML processing, uh, if you're doing that. Um, below that, you have your standard application support services. Uh, this is your uh, data management, your data distribution, uh, security, management of sensors. Um, those sorts of things. And then finally at the bottom, um, something that's really common these days uh, in commercial and industry um, is uh, service orchestration, right? So this is our Kubernetes or Darker Swarms or other uh, forms of uh, container management. Um, now, when we start talking about uh, what edge optimized application services are, um, a lot of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with a lot of the uh, techniques out there. Um, for bringing uh, our heavyweight processing, our, our machine learning models, for example, uh, to the edge. Uh, there's a lot of standard things out there like TensorRT and DeepStream um, <clears throat> that you can go ahead and use that will work on an NVIDIA Jetson um, or even a Raspberry Pi um, if you uh, optimize it well enough. Um, and these kind of, this level of uh, this layer of the architecture really maps really well to the uh, CFS apps that are, you know, that you develop for your space platform. Next, uh, when we're talking about edge optimized application support services, uh, this is where we're talking about the things that allow you to execute that business logic, but optimized for uh, your edge system. So we're talking about distributed storage. Um, you're talking about uh, specific things you might do for edge security, uh, a variety of things you might do to manage your, ban uh, manage, uh, your network. Um, and then uh, data distribution, specific middlewares there, which is kind of my area of expertise. 
Um, certainly, uh, all sorts of mobile sensors come to play here. Um, and then, as we talked about, uh, I believe yesterday, um, you know, there's some work starting up in, uh, you know, swarming for computation distribution, how you might handle that. Uh, so these really kind of map really well to the kind of the CFE core flight services uh, in, in the core flight uh, software. Now, when we get into edge optimized surface orchestration, what we're really talking about here is uh, lightweight distribution uh, mechanisms for managing the surfaces you're running. So, in, uh, for example, the IoT world, you might be doing something like K3S or micro K8S, but there's a couple of uh, different choices here. Um, and as I'll talk about in a little while, there, there may be an opportunity here um, uh, for uh, the space community to look into. Uh, finally, down here at the service virtualization level, this is, you know, obviously how you're stocking your services on your platforms. Um, this really gets into our more heavyweight virtual machines, which I'm sure you guys aren't going to see very much of. Um, but co containerization is something that I think is definitely going to be, uh, you know, certainly within the test environments that we've talked about quite a bit. Um, but obviously, you're also going to be uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, native OS uh, uh, interactions there. And then finally, uh, on the right, can't really read that, um, but it really gets into our uh, testing and monitoring support, which um, if you look at uh, obviously all the talks that have already happened with things like NOS Cubed, uh, there's obviously a lot of support in this community for that sort of thing. And really it's a prerequisite in order to uh, fly things into space. So that's really well understood. So um, I'm gonna present two focus areas that I think um, potentially uh, be areas uh, that different research efforts could look into as, as we kind of move forward. Uh, the first one is that service orchestration and virtualization uh, kind of area. And, um, you know, this really gets into the way that a lot of people are fielding um, our systems these days. As we're doing containerization, we're specifically picking different kind of uh, platforms and uh, services that we want to package with our stuff. Um, and it really is really important as, you know, these teams and these missions that you guys are working in grow bigger um, and get more collaborative. Um, containerization provides an easy way to kind of manage uh, that collaboration uh, because you have existing frameworks that you'll be able to use there. Um, they can also uh, be, you know, there's all sorts of projects out there uh, for minimization. You look at something like Alpine Linux, stripped down to the very basics of what you might want to run. Um, and there's all sorts of orchestration tools out there, like I talked about, uh, that can really match up well with the frameworks like CFS that pretty much work in a very similar way. Um, now, of course, the question is, can you really fly something uh, that's running virtualized uh, or containerized services? And, you know, I'm not the expert here, obviously, um, but uh, I would say uh, probably not now, but I think it's coming, right? So you, we, we've mentioned Docker a couple times in this conference. It comes up a lot in the presentations in the previous years. Um, and, you know, uh, Moore's Law is, uh, while we're not strictly following it anymore, hardware is getting stronger. And at some point, you're going to be able to meet your real-time deadlines uh, running services that are c containerized. You know, you'll be able to start throwing enough computation at it so you can do what you need to do. Um, and more importantly, um, the reliability and availability kind of strategies that are required in order to uh, do a space platform, you know, that's something that there's a lot of work in in the commercial industrial world. You know, you look at something like well, AWS is in order to, uh, to support, you know, Black Monday, you know, that, that is a lot of work. And yes, it all really comes down to resource availability, right? Um, but the techniques are there, your hot swaps and your memory sharing and all those different things, the techniques are there and it's really a matter of the hardware catching up. And then finally, um, app distribution services. So how you distribute data. Um, now I'm gonna make a point, you know, obviously you've heard multiple uh, conversations over the past week about how uh, uh, tools like DDS are starting to be integrated in CFS. Um, different flavors of it. Um, and really the question there is, you know, or really the, the point that I want to make is that, you know, on-platform comms is generally easy. Yes, you know, if it provides value for complex missions, 
in order, in order to kind of channelize your different data uh, in order in, into different uh, services and, and, and potentially uh, on, on platform computation. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead and do that. But for the most part, what you can do on that platform or what you need to do on that platform is going to be provided sufficiently by, you know, your standard uh, CFS uh, software bus with its UDP and, and uh, multicast uh, kind of, uh, you know, data passing. But where I think um, it's going to get interesting is your uplinks and downlinks, right? Uh, you know, I've done a lot of work in the DTN world, and we kind of know how store carry forward goes and scheduling your uplinks and downlinks. Well, is, you know, in a world where we have PLEO constellations like Kuiper and Starlink, are we going to get into a world where uh, we will be able to send data kind of more at the time of need? Um, and, you know, are we going to have to do uh, some more unreliable connection kind of management if we have those sorts of situations where I've got maybe a 15-second window to get to the Starlink access point? Um, and maybe I'm in a world, uh, you know, where I need to do some discovery because I haven't updated uh, my Starlink uh, history list, and, and, you know, maybe there's more of a dynamic discovery aspect that I can take advantage of uh, in order to get these connections going. So I would argue that, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. Um, so the last thing I want to leave you with is really just kind of uh, a statement, you know, the, the level of work that you guys do is obviously, you know, world leading and industry leading. I have the utmost respect. Everybody that's yeah has the utmost respect for everything you do. That's why I'm here. Um, but a lot of the stuff you do has analogs, you know, 80 to 90 percent analogs the, in kind of the commercial and specifically the edge processing worlds. And we can leverage a lot of the power and the research and quite honestly, the investment that the different companies in defense and, you know, uh, you know hazard uh, management kind of areas uh, have, have already put into this space. And, you know, as uh, hardware continues to advance at some point, you know, if, if you can either modify that or, you know, get another processor, it might be sufficient for your needs. Um, so that's pretty much my time, and uh, I'll take any questions. All right, we do have one question online, I guess. Sure. Um, what are the main differences between traditional time and space partitioning um, versus running applications in containers? Well, it depends on your operating system, right? Um, there's been a whole lot of uh, talk, and there's an entire Slack channel on uh, using Linux to, to manage those sorts of things. Um, and so you can obviously uh, partition what you want, but that's kind of more of a manual thing, and you get a lot of that for free. Um, if you think about, like, for example, the, uh, the Psyche uh, uh, presentation that was on Monday, uh, where they were actively, you know, purchasing out this, the sections uh, of memory, um, you use your, com your containerization in order to, to grab those pieces of memory, um, and you kind of get that for free. Uh, Isaiah Garrett. So one problem that we've run into using tools like these is getting our architecture locked into that particular tool. For sure. instance, we had to change our containerization framework and it was kind of a pain. Sure. Um, what, te what techniques do you recommend to sort of use the tools but keep our architecture decoupled from them? I mean, mostly focusing on open source, right? Um, so, you know, anything... It's a, it's a very fraught world right now if you pay attention to the way open source licensing has kind of migrated over time. Um, and, you know, if you look at what VMware has done recently or, you know, Red Hat Linux kind of a thing, you have to be obviously be aware of that. Um, and a lot of stuff that we've done on some of the edge projects we've done is we've actually just gone ahead and forked what we need to so that we have the versions that are uh, necessary in order to do our work. Um, certainly, you're never going to get into a world where everything's going to be happy and perfect, but leveraging the open source uh, work and forking if you need to is kind of uh, a, a best practice, I might put it that way. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So when we talk about shipping Docker containers or think containers over like very small bandwidths, I mean, are you sure. So we're seeing 200, 300K CFS apps 
two plus mag Docker container uh, sure. with CFS in it. Right. You know, are you doing like the Docker create on the edge node, or are you doing the Docker create back on the other side and shipping the whole container? So it depends on your capabilities, right? So if we get into a world where I can upload stuff off of, off of Starlink, maybe I can send like a, a megabyte uh, container kind of a thing. Um, but if I have uh, enough processing power there, then you know maybe that makes an argument to do it that way. It really depends on your platform and your capabilities. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, yeah. Garrett again. Um, so what resources do you recommend to get up to speed with the current state of the art for edge processing if we've sort of spent a lot of time in the flight software realm? Uh, so the Software Engineering Institute loves that question, um, and I can provide you with all sorts of uh, edge uh, workshop uh, presentations and, and white papers that we've written. Sweet. Thank you. Yep. All right. Let's uh, thank a speaker. And uh, thank you.